A couple of days ago, there was a debate due to be held at Christchurch about um, abortion. Indeed, one of the speakers billed to be on the proposition bench was supposed to be speaking, which ended up being shut down um, due to the threats of extreme protests by WOMCAM and other feminist groups. Thank you. This is not a debate about whether WOMCAM were right to protest that debate. It is not a debate about whether the um, officers of Christchurch were right to then rescind their invitation for that debate to take place. This is not a debate about whether NUS's famed no platform policies are correct or not. It is a debate about whether popularity, that one specific, fairly numerical criterion, is sufficient is sufficient grounds to give somebody a platform. If you are the, the leader, the curator of a platform, and you have the power of that platform to give. That's what this debate is about, and that's really why we win it. But before I get into my main points, it's my privilege to introduce the speakers on the proposition bench. The first speaker, the member from Standing Committee from Wadham College, is a prime example of what happens if you give a platform to somebody on the strength of their popularity, <laughs> Mr. President. <laughs> That's my bitchiness over for the debate, at least as far as I can attempt to. Rising to fame as the admin of Overheard in Oxford Uni, um, he has since curated the massive and influential No to Meet Free Mondays campaign at his college and has indeed risen to the standing committee of the society. Speaking second, um, the member for Kellogg, Co Kellogg College on the proposition is a researcher, a journalist, an open source activist, founded Creative Commons South Africa, which is a pretty big deal if you've never heard of it, um, and is currently studying at the Oxford Insti Internet Institute how Wikipedians make history as it happens. Um, if you've ever had a last minute article to write about um, Ojinene constituency in Namibia, you have her to thank because she wrote most of the Wikipedia article. And third of all, on the proposition bench, Mr. Tom Slater, a deputy editor from Spiked magazine and currently um, a leader of the Down With Campus Censorship campaign, who has been touring UK campuses to talk against no platform policies, perfectly preparing him, therefore, for a debate slightly different to the one that we're going to have today. <laughs> These are your guests, Mr. President, and we welcome them. So I'm going to structure my, debate, my speech in the form of three obvious truths. I don't think they're truths that anyone in this room is going to disagree with, and I think that taken together, they imply that we on the opposition win. Truth number one, not giving somebody a platform is not the same as denying them free speech. Not giving somebody a platform is not the same as denying them free speech. Because Joe has talked a lot, and I imagine the rest of the proposition will also say, talk about the values of free speech, about the values of allowing our views and opinions to be challenged. They will talk about what John Stuart Mill says in his influential book um, on liberty, where he says it is only by the collision of adverse opinions that the, rem that the um, remainder, or something like that, of the truth, I can't read my own handwriting, um, Good. I was quoting from his blog, so I'm glad he remembers it. Um, John Stuart Mill says this, and he's probably correct. We should allow a free and fair marketplace of ideas in order to allow ideas to be improved. What's the problem with this in the context of this debate? Well, the problem with this in the context of this debate is that not giving somebody a platform, not picking them to speak on one of these benches of this illustrious society, not inviting them to Christchurch to speak in a debate, not putting them in the pages of the Daily Telegraph or the Spectator is not the same thing as preventing them from participating in the marketplace of ideas. We very much agree, and I'm pretty certain my colleagues on the opposition bench agree, that it is important to allow people to express their ideas, to not imprison them or ban them from expressing their ideas. Not giving them a platform is very different. That's why if Proposition talked to you about why it's necessary that we have a marketplace of ideas of this sort in order for public opinion to progress, it's a red herring. It's not about platforms. That's about freedom of speech. And we're perfectly happy with freedom of speech on our side of the house. Brendan O'Neill, the speaker who was billed to be on the proposition bench, who was meant to be in that um, abortion debate the other day, complains 
about his lack of freedom of speech for that debate to having been cancelled. He complains about that in his weekly column in the Daily Telegraph. He complains about that on the front page of The Spectator. We are not shutting down people's freedom of speech on this side of the House, Mr. President. Indeed, we think we, that definitely shouldn't happen. What we're talking about, and it's very important to be clear, is about whether we're giving people a platform, whether we, as the curators of a platform, are giving somebody a pedestal from which to speak. And we think that's the key thing in this debate that makes it different from just freedom of speech, as Joe's talked about. Obvious fact number two. Platforms have consequences. I think we're all in agreement, I hope we're all in agreement, that if you're in charge of a platform, you will not give that platform to somebody who threatens to commit violence upon members of the opposition. If I say to my aunt, yeah, sure, I'll speak in this debate, but I should warn you, I will throw rocks at the audience while I'm doing so, it is correct and reasonable for my aunt not, for Mr. President, not to give me that platform. And then we have this sort of distinction, or at least some people say it's a distinction, between that physical violence and psychological or emotional or mental trauma that we might think about. And speakers like our guest speaker on the proposition bench have suggested that it's patronizing to acknowledge, to, to acknowledge that words and speeches can harm members of the audience, they can prevent members in the audience from taking part in a debate. Mr. President, it's not patronizing at all to say that, for instance, a trans person for whom the speech of a transphobic speaker might remind them of the fact that they are far more statistically likely to be the victims of transphobic violence and therefore will not turn up to that debate, or if they do turn up to that debate, will leave feeling physically and emotionally weaker for it. It is not patronizing to say that they have suffered as a result of listening to that debate. It is not patronizing for a member of a minority ethnicity to feel wounded if they listen to an invited speaker, which a prestigious platform such as this has invited to dinner and talked to very politely, who then suggests that immigration is the source of all the problems in this country, to feel wounded after hearing that speaker speak. It is not patronizing to say that a woman who, statistically speaking, may have been the victim of sexual assault to feel wounded if a speaker comes to a prestigious platform such as this and talks in mocking or derisive tones using the language of sexual assault. That's not patronizing. That's not in some way fetishizing some notion of comfort or security over good old-fashioned dissidence and rhetoric. That's just accepting what is the fact. That is accepting the nature of the situation that people and audiences find themselves in. Because such speakers, Mr. President, prevent access to free and fair debate. They don't, they don't embrace it, they don't empower it, but they prevent people from being able to access the venue that we so rightly value as a venue for free and fair debate. Joe talks about safe spaces as though they're a very restricted category of spaces generally. Mr. President, all spaces should be to some degree safe. I'm not saying that we should prevent debate happening in all spaces. I'm saying that we should always take into account the safety of the participants of a space when we're enabling that space to exist and that space to be used for debate. <coughs> Obvious fact number three. Curators of a platform have responsibility. What do I mean by curators of a platform? I mean the president of a debating society. I mean the editor of a newspaper. I mean the editor um, of a TV show or discussion program. Um, I mean anyone who is in the position to decide who gets to put their view forward. Obviously, and I think this is just like factually the case, they can't let everybody who wants their position to be put forward to be put forward. So they have some kind of responsibility immediately. But moreover, as respected institutions, platforms are looked to as filters to indicate the kind of views that represent the scope of the local or regional or national or international conversation. I'm not saying here that people are stupid and need to take their views out of whatever the president of the Oxford Union tells them is the acceptable range of views. I'm saying that people are sensible and rational and don't have the time to investigate absolutely everything. And so look to these kind of respected institutions as a guide to what is the respected 
set of beliefs, what are the likely reasonable set of opinions and beliefs. So obviously, platforms should not seek to perpetuate some kind of like privileged orthodoxy or groupthink or something like that. But at the same time, mere popularity, which remember is what proposition are defending, does not entail that the curators of platforms have an obligation to present absolutely every single view that might happen to be popular. Because for every person who listens to the free and fair debate that Joe talks about and hears who happened to win that debate, there are several more people who only look at the order sheet, who only look at who was speaking and use that as a guide to which opinions were respectable. So, Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, if this debate were about no platform policies, if this were de debate were about drugs classification, as Joe wants to use in his example, then like almost every debate that takes place in this chamber, the answer would be, it depends. Happily, that's not this debate. This debate is about whether popularity is a sufficient criterion to give somebody a platform. And Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, it is clearly not. And it is for that reason that I beg to stand on the opposition bench.